Okay, so this is part two of the synthesis video here. We're going to consider 2016's uh, AP Lane synthesis prompt as our sample here to work with, to use as example. It's in the drive as well to look over and to use, but otherwise, um, again, treat this like a research paper, guys. Just make sure that you're kind of like stripping away the AP bullshit here and there and just thinking about like, okay, well, if I was given this prompt as a research paper for um, another high school class or your college courses, how would you basically approach it? Uh, just in this case, a bit shorter of time, right? No, a bit, a, a lot shorter of time. But anyways, let's go over this real quick here. So the prompt says, over the past several decades, the English language has become increasingly globalized, and it is now seen by many as a dominant language in international finance, science, and politics. Concurrent with the worldwide spread of English is the decline of foreign language learning in English-speaking countries, where monolingualism, the use of a single language, remains a norm. This is context, like we talked about before. The first paragraph's always going to be like, here's some information about the reading here, in case you knew nothing about it, or just kind of set up the whole situation, right? First part is just uh, prompt context. Second part, the actual prompt. Carefully read the following six sources, including the introductory information for each source, the little box in italics, then synthesize information from at least three of the sources, but go for four and incorporate it into a coherent, well-developed essay that argues a clear position on whether monolingual English speakers are at a disadvantage today. Your argument should be the focus of your essay. So we're going to go uh, right into the actual prompt, which is the paragraph above. The last part is just talking about like how you can cite your sources um, in terms of like quotation, paraphrase, or summary. Just make sure you cite them as like source A and B and whatever, right? But otherwise, the prompt is that last line above, clear position, on whether monolingual English speakers are at a disadvantage today, which is basically a yes or no question, right? Are they disadvantaged or not? And it really is just that simple. What do you think? Do you think people who are monolingual in English are at an advantage or are they at a disadvantage? Or um, maybe that's not the right way to phrase it. Maybe the right way to phrase it is, are they at a disadvantage or are they fine? Are they basically safe from the dangers that people say? Uh, take a stance on that. But next part, provide why, right? In this case, yes, no questions usually need, require you to tell me like, why is it the case or why are they at a disadvantage, not at a disadvantage, whatever. Make sure you have a stance, make sure you can defend it with research and so forth. So step one, we're gonna go through six, I believe, steps in terms of how to approach the entire uh, synthesis process. So when you get your prompt and you read everything, don't go to the sources yet, just sit there for a quick minute here and just think about this. What's your stance on this? On a genuine level, I know they're going to ask you some bullshit questions about, um, in 2019, the prompt was about, uh, what was it, like windmills or some shit, right? Like, if you took apes, good for you. You probably had, like, a huge leg up in terms of, like, answering that prompt, but they're going to ask you some really random stuff, right? Like, uh, one of the prompts was about libraries, and we had, like, local forums. Like, what the hell? No one talks about this at all. But in this case, fine. Take with a grain of salt. Just think about, like, all right, fine, 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 fine. If I actually have a stance, what would it be, right? So... For me, I'm taking this as a serious question. Do I think monolingual English speakers have a disadvantage? I think, yeah, I, uh, for sure. Because one, speaking two languages has way more benefits from business relations to cultural background, intimacy, access to works from other countries and so forth. And I'm also thinking like, well, your disadvantage basically is you have no access to all that there. And at the same time, you have no alternative or options in terms of one language, one culture, uh, one existence. So on the very first part of everything, I got to make sure I have a stance. Second, all right, my stance is very clear in terms of where I stand, but I got to form into a thesis now. So here's how I broke it down and how I formulated it. Although a more globalized world has universally utilized English as the primary language, monolingual English speakers lose opportunities that allow them to access foreign cultural goods. So this is kind of like a concession thesis here. Here's how I broke it down. Half of it concedes the other side as context. I acknowledge the fact that we are in a more globally accepting and using world of English language. But my second half is my stance. Problem with that still is that monolingual English speakers lose opportunities. So in this case, uh, I specify that even a little bit more because I'm talking about the fact that they're losing opportunities to access foreign cultural goods. And you can give a long list afterwards in terms of what those goods are, or you can just make like a three point thesis if you'd like to, it doesn't matter. As long as you're clear with your stance here, uh, where do you stand and why? And I've answered that here. So number two, form a thesis from your stance. Number three, 
consider your evidences. So this is what they mean by reading the little intro boxes on top here. They will always give you author, the year it was written, um, the title of the piece itself, and also where is it generally from on the little italics on the bottom here. Uh, my challenge for you before you go on, you can if you want to, but you don't have to necessarily, is you should read all the sources here first and at least get a general idea. The classwork requires you to answer a few questions regarding each source to kind of like build yourself for the possible new AP exam, but otherwise, uh, here's kind of how I approach this here. What I do is, before I even begin my essay whatsoever, I gotta think about what is College Board giving me in terms of my possible sources. I might change my thesis if my sources are all pretty much against my particular stance. Write what's easier, write what's easiest, right? So in this case, I'll just a quick summary in terms of why I chose this source and how I might support my particular uh, piece itself. I'm looking at the first one, it's by Berman. And the title was Foreign Language for Foreign Policy? Question mark. And this is about uh, higher education and how we should have uh, more, more teachings of foreign language for the development of people, for cultural enrichment and so forth. I'm thinking, perfect, I need this one because that's my whole point, right? Opportunities. Second one, why do the English need to speak a foreign language when foreigners all speak English? Ah, sounds challenging, sounds like it's going to go against me. Probably won't use. If you want to do a counter argument, fine, but at least for my stance, it's not useful, right? Third one, uh, I skip C and I think F, they're in the next page, but otherwise the point being that uh, they're separate sources because College Board couldn't publish them on the actual site itself, but I give it to you anyways. But anyways, source D, foreign language learning, what the United States is missing out on. Boom, sounds good again, because it sounds like it brings up my point. What are we missing out on the opportunities? Hey, A and D sound kind of similar. I might combine those two later. E, population in five years and older who spoke a language other than English at home by language group and English speaking ability. So if you look at that table there, it shows how uh, kids who are, you know, bilingual have possible dangers of not being proficient in English. And I'm thinking like, okay, well, that seems to be a little wedge in my argument here, but I could use it as a turnaround because I can talk about the numbers and infer where it's not a big deal or we can change it around because a number of these kids are five based on this chart here. There's a long way before they uh, have before mastering English. You know what I mean? Like I, I wouldn't assess kids at five whether they master English or not. So in this case, I could use this as a counter but also to turn my argument around. Uh, the other two sources I could also use as well. One of them is titled, Are We Really Monolingual? And the entire source basically focused on the fact that uh, actually, most Americans are bilingual. It's just that the questions for the census, haha, relationship between the video that I chose, uh, is that it, the census asks the question inaccurately. So most Americans are like, oh, well, I'm monolingual. And it's kind of like, no, 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 you're, you're bilingual. Don't worry about it, right? So in this case, maybe my point here is that we're actually more bilingual than we think. So Americans don't have to worry so much about being uh, monolingual. Maybe it's a conclusion paragraph or a last paragraph. Last uh, source. The Rise and Fall of the American Linguistic Empire. Wow, that sounds like it's going to support me like crazy because this one just shows how America has lost its linguistic ability and the empire itself falls down. We rose at first and then we fell. So in this case, I could use it to definitely defend my points here. Step four. I got some really good evidences, but now i got to find some relationships between the evidences. Otherwise, I'm not synthesizing, right? So you can mix and match however you like. I'm just giving my plan of attack right here in terms of uh, finding relationships between my sources. Number one, source A and D both talk about how multilingualism isn't just for business or politics, it's also for enrichment. Combining like that, boom, I got one body paragraph. Source F suggests that Americans are falling behind because of our lack of language, but source C number says that we're actually a lot more multilingual than we think. So. Maybe Americans have nothing to fear because we're actually a lot more accessible to um, other cultures. We just don't want to acknowledge or um, admit that fact for whatever reason. And then as a perhaps counter paragraph, remember the chart with the whole like five-year-olds in English speaking? That one says that there are kids who are falling behind or whatever, but I make like, the argument where, hey, they're five. Reverse that in time, when they're 10 or 13 or whatever, they probably have mastered English and they got a second language on top of their peers, now they're ahead, you know what I mean? So in this case, I can flip an argument and infer, and that could be sophistication at that point, because the chart itself says nothing, but I'm making a point with it by inferring or whatever. Step five, 
I gotta have some topics and things now. I got my evidences lined up, but I gotta make sure that I actually have things that support my thesis and also relate back to the evidences I've chosen. So these are just some sample ones that I came up with, and I'm gonna show you how I kind of combine my sources into them. So for the first one, topic one, the issue with learning a foreign language is that its function is often limited in perspective. Language is learned not just for economic and political gains, but for the enrichment and universal tasks. So my point here is that we often think of another language being learned for like monetary gains or for like some other, I guess, like physical gain, but it should be something that's more emotional, psychological, spiritual, I don't know, something like that, right? Something for enrichment in this case. Topic two. The irony here is that while we fear the limits of a monolingual society, America is more bilingual than we believe. So in this case, I'm kind of shifting my argument a little bit here, where uh, even though we fear that monolingual speakers lose opportunities, no fret. Actually, America is a lot more bilingual than we believe. So in this case here, we're actually fitting into a global world uh, a lot more snug than we thought. Now, there are some people who might criticize this whole bilingual situation, right? Because some people are like, oh, well, you're bilingual, you're gonna lose English skills. Not quite, because again, I'm inferring from that chart that the kids have weak foundations there now, but flip the script, uh, a few years later, they're going to be above their peers. And fine, let's say I bite the bullet and say that the kids do uh, have less English skills. Like, that's, it was a small percentage compared to the overall whole, right? So in this case, I could kind of work around the numbers in that way and still defend my point if I feel like the opposition will question my point. And then later, step six, uh, finding evidence. Now, hold on, you're thinking like, wait, I just found my evidences. This sounds all correct and perfect. No, 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 hold on, hold on. My point is this. <clears throat> evidence simply means from the text itself, what particular information are you pulling out? So you have your sources all chosen now. You found the complements between them, but what are some of the best lines or examples in there that I want to pull out? So my questions in mind are, uh, what pieces, number one, support my point of view or my topic sentences? I'm looking for facts. Anecdotes and ethos are nice, but I want as much data, findings, reportings within the readings, or the author's logos, for example. I need more concrete stuff. I need stuff that can defend my point of view on a more objective level. Speed reading, you want to be careful because you have a lot less time to find those examples. So as you're reading and test your eyes with the sample one that I give you in the, um, what do you call it? the sample one in the drive, look for, you know, some key lines regarding numbers, dates, proper nouns, key statements, things that can help support your point of view. So when you're speed reading through the sources, you're looking for very exact things. Skim and understand, you know, skim and understand as much as you can, but otherwise look for lines that stick out where you're like, I gotta use this one. This one's perfect for me to use regarding my essay. This one basically says what I wanna say, but from an expert's or author's view. And with that, you're finding evidence there. So overall, I give a student sample in this video here to end off to see what a student does. Uh, this is why I don't like talking about essays that are like 2017 and below. It's because there are still handwritten uh, examples without typed versions online for us. So it's going to be kind of hard to read if you don't have a teacher's eye. So I typed out the first part for you. Uh, let's look at the student sample, right? Their sample thesis. And it writes as so. Monolingual English speakers are at a disadvantage in today's world because business practices benefit those who speak multiple languages. They miss out on the culture the rest of the world has to offer, and, though, and they don't benefit from the educational benefits that learning a language offers. Kind of a standard three-point um, essay, and the biggest word in here is the because. They're giving a reason. They're giving kind of like a why to this whole situation. If they simply wrote monolingual English speakers are at a disadvantage in today's world, I'm thinking like, okay... How, right? What's your backup? What are your reasons? They give a big list of items here and they support their examples there. Um, I don't really want to go through the example per se in terms of um, how they merge their sources together because you can you can definitely read it through. It's a super short uh, body paragraph, which is kind of my point in just picking this one body paragraph out. Uh, don't get me wrong, the student samples on for you to peruse and read and everything, but I just want to show you that. Look at this. Boom, boom, right? It's a super short body paragraph. They synthesize two sources with each other, and they move on to the next one. They made a point. They found two sources to support that point, and they go to the next paragraph, and it's just as long as this for the synthesis essay. So they're not asking for a lot. They're just asking, can you prove a point with some evidence, make some sense with that evidence, and then later, you know, 
go on and on and on. So if you look at the other body paragraphs the student also writes, they're all equally pretty short and the same length as this. And it's not that scary, guys. Just make sure you have a point. The organization part is the entire game. Once you have everything set up for your research paper, for your sentences, then you're ready to write. And the writing process will take no more than 15, 20 minutes, I guarantee you. It's super fast once you have everything figured out. So that's my sort of like thought process regarding synthesis. Same thing for research papers. You just have the luxury of time for research papers to go at home, look at the evidences and sources that you wanna do, and then put them together for a coherent argument, a stance that you have.